So Moya Talks is back, finally, after two months. And we have a special guest today, Manuel Mani Valencia, who joins us from Dallas. He is the founder of Connective Agency, a Dallas-based team of strategic communication, digital communication, research, sales marketing, that evaluates, improves, and delivers integrated programs focused on measurable success. Hi, Manny. Thank there you for go. accepting the invitation. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you. What an honor. So happy to be here. Excellent. So let's start. Manuel, you are from, well, your family is from Ecuador. Could you tell us more about your background and story? Yeah, absolutely. So if I get emotional at all, it's because, you know, my family means obviously everything to me. But so if you can imagine this, so in the 19 late, like mid to late 1960s, uh, my my mother and my father, they're both from Rio Bamba, Ecuador. Uh, my mother came here to the United States first and um, they they had dated in, in Ecuador. And so uh, he he arrived. But he didn't quite know like where she was. Like he had heard that she was in Queens, New York. So when he when he got here, he on the weekends or after work, he would take a bus to Queens. He was in New Jersey. He would take a bus to Queens and just walk around the streets and like see if he could find her. And so he he came across a, a gentleman that he recognized who was also from Ecuador. And he's like, oh my God. He's like, ¿Cómo estás, hermano? You know, and like he's like, hey, have you seen like Julita Samaniego, like, and she's like, yeah, I think they live like over there somewhere. So eventually, like, through his stalking, <laughs> he did he did find her, and uh, you know, as they say, like, the rest is history. Like, they uh, have worked so hard uh, to give me and my brother and our family like everything we could have ever wanted. So, um, yeah, you know, it's uh, it's sort of appropriate that for Hispanic Heritage Month that we sort of honor all their their efforts and and their and their work and their dedication to like just give their family like just a better life you know more opportunities and so yeah that's one of the things that we celebrate this month and um yeah love those guys wish I was here damn you COVID wish I was wish wish they were with me <laughs> I'll bring them on on camera right now yeah, that's probably one of the best stories we have heard in my thoughts. <laughs> yeah, Honestly. yeah, I'll, and you know, look, I will add really quick that you know, so my father, his family in back in Ecuador, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the television show The Dukes of Hazard, right? Yes. But they were, they were, um, they made aguardiente, right? So they like my my father and his brother were like Bo and Luke Duke, and then my my grandfather was like Uncle Jesse, and he he was actually injured in an ambush by the police and so the and one so eventually like one of the reasons why we came here was because he had to have major surgeries to like live um and so many years later after my father got here he eventually ended up back in in the liquor business he he purchased a 50 year old brand and he ran it for for 31 years and so many lessons i learned about business were from him you know there's this very famous photo photo booth strip of, of pictures that he took with his skinny tie and his suit. And he's like looking up and it just, I think it's like very uh, appropriate and symptomatic of like, you know, his vision, like I'm here, like I arrived and he's like, you know, the only way is up from now, you know, cause he got here to the state. So it's awesome. I'll post it on my Instagram so you can see it. So bootlegging is how the Kennedy started. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he he was driving a truck through the mountains of Ecuador with at 13 years of of age uh, with his lights off, you know, running running alcohol, you know. Yeah. Uh, so you 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 have come a, a long way. You started <laughs> in Michigan and New Jersey. Yes. And you can live in different parts of the states. What is your take on the diversity of the Hispanic community in the United States? Yeah, it's interesting. So, you know, I grew up in, in the New York, New Jersey area and 
m many might argue that that's like the most one of the most diverse places in the United States, right? Arguably in the world because it's Gotham City. It's like where everything happens, where everything is possible. Jay Z and Alicia Keys even say it. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, you know, there you get access to comida caribeña and like you get Colombian restaurants and Ecuadorian restaurants and like everything, right? And so now we live in Texas, we live in Dallas. And, you know, what I didn't get so much exposure to in New York was Mexican food, like tacos and all their rich, all their rich um, uh, platos and, and, and everything that they have. So I, I uh, have, you know, after being here for a while, like I missed, I missed uh, Dominican food, I missed uh, Puerto Rican food. And so we, we had a delivery the other day and there was a gentleman that came to our house and he was obviously Dominican. Like I was like, I was like, are you Dominicano? And he's like, yeah. And I said, man, I miss Dominican food so much. I said, uh, you know, here in Dallas, they don't really have it. He goes, yes, they do. He's like, one just opened up. It's called El Rey del Sabor. And I was like, oh my God. I'm like, please tell me where I can go get it. <laughs> I was like, I miss Dominican food so much. And he's like, you know, it's in Irving. So I went there immediately, like the, the next day. And so I think that's the cool thing, like in, in the United States, all over, wherever you live, you, you know, there you'll find Latinos, like they're there, they're concentrated, you know, different, different Latinos in, in different places. So obviously in LA and then in Miami, you sort of have like the career. And so in Texas, more Mexican influence in New York, all Detroit. So that's to me is super fascinating is that you can go to different parts of the U S you'll find different Latinos, but you know, we're all sort of like one in the same. You know, whenever you go somewhere, you find a Spanish speaking person, like you're instantly like brothers or sisters or friends. Like it's, we have that bond. But we now have a generation of Hispanic and Latinos that have attained higher levels of education and are taking more and more prominent roles <laughs> in business, politics, science, education. How have the perceptions towards Latinos and Hispanic changing? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, when I was growing up, I, I, I experienced discrimination from one of my closest friends. I was, we were, I remember we were sitting on the steps and her, her father came home and he said like the meanest things about like me and my cousin we were sitting there. He basically like told us to get out of there to go home because, you know, we weren't sort of like the right color for, for him. Right. And, you know, for, for a long time, like I carry that pain and hurt. Um, but then like I turned it into a motivation. I was like, I, I'm never going to let someone's words like make me feel like that ever again. So it drove me for a long time. Um, fast forward. I remember when I was coming out of like business school, undergrad business school, you know, maybe you would see one, Hispanic leader on like a roster of, of CEOs or CXOs or entrepreneurs, right? Uh, so I think what's happened is it, it's gone from like maybe one to now there's some, and I think we have to keep driving so that there will be more, right? Always more, always more, like always, always shooting for higher and farther and, and being inspiration to others because I, you know, when I started out my job search and I would go on websites or even before before websites, really, you would have brochures and you would look at a company's leadership and there's there was not a lot of diversity there. Right. It was pretty homogenous. And so, you know, I think that one of the things, one of the great things that has happened is that leadership in companies and enterprises looks like America now and, and continues to look more and more like America. And that's a good thing. It's great. Like. It also means that the community and its diversity is better represented. Um, yes. And this has changed the panorama. But in that sense, what areas do you think still need improvement? Yeah, um, I think that, you know, you hear the term like majority minority, right? And that is a a an awesome thing and so i would say that it is the area that needs improvement is is empathy right like you you sort of need to understand you have to do some work potentially to understand like 
where what are where are people coming from like what's what's their background right like you have to understand people's um culture their 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 motivations it's not enough to just show up and 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 give someone like a place to to do their thing like so for example here we celebrate birthdays we celebrate work anniversaries we have like we have surveys of our folks like to really understand like what it is they like we under we know where every single person went to university because every once in a while like we'll give them uh, a university of insert like a hoodie or pajamas or like a sleeping bag or a blanket like you know it just shows that you went a little bit further to understand like them so it's, you know i think that empathy is the thing that that really still needs focus right it's not necessarily we can't only be transaction driven we can't only be mm -hmm. business focused we have to be like people focused oh, beautiful beautiful all right this is out of the script but i really want to know how do you get from michigan and new jersey to dallas oh uh okay so she's gonna watch this so uh, my wife <laughs> and she she's one of the, the the most talented and one of the best people in america at what she does and i'm i'm not saying that because i have to because i'm married to her but like she really truly is uh phenomenal she was uh, the, the chief marketing officer at three successive publicly traded companies. Uh, and so the last stop, the last one was here in, in Dallas, Texas. She became the CMO at a global industrial construction company. And two and a half years after after arriving here, somehow, some way, she decided to go into business with her wacky husband and take a risk and place a bet on herself and and, and enter the world of entrepreneurship. So uh, that's the reason why we got here. And then Connective Agency is the reason why we're staying here. We're we're local, uh, but we're global. So we, we we do serve clients here locally, like the housing authority that's here. And then we also, this very week, actually today, we're working with a client that's based out of Italy that has 20 locations around the world uh, that's in the, in the industrial design space. And they're at Neocon conference. So yeah. Great, so uh, romanticism runs in the Valencia's blood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's a family thing. Right. right. So I, I have become familiar with your work and connective agency work over the last month working with you. And you have done amazing work. What Thank are you. some of your favorite projects? Thank you. Yeah. You know, if, if you can wake up every day and and get to do things that like changes people's lives and is fulfilling to you like wow how lucky is that right so so we locally here we have we work with um you heard me say before the the, the public housing office uh it, it they're they're called dha they're one of the, the biggest in the country they help like so many families, over 50,000 families get access to safe, quality, affordable housing through their programs um, that are tied in even federally. And so, you know, we get to do that. We get to create, imagine and grow their scholarship foundation that has handed out now over one and a half million dollars to residents of the public housing authority so that they can then go off to college and break that generational cycle of poverty. like. Wow, right? Like that's so that's so awesome that we get to do that. Another group we work here we work with here is called Big Thought, and they help you know the over 150,000 kids that are in the Dallas Independent School District with uh, after school programs around emotional learning and creativity, right? And then you think about like that client I mentioned that we're in Chicago with right now that that they save some of the four and a half billion pounds of carpets that go into landfills every year. Like they actually they harvest that and they regenerate the nylon and they turn it into beautiful materials and textiles that are used by some of the biggest brands like all around the world. Um, we we are the agency of record for allied van lines. Like we help them move people and, 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 be, and be known and very important during the pandemic, right? Relocations and stuff. So we we work with them and and their network of, of over 400 agents all across the country. So, yeah, we 
and then we work with local hyper local brands and then also global brands so yeah we get to we get to be involved in some really neat things and we're and very grateful for it so through your work with these diverse housing authorities mm -hmm. you must have become familiar with the particularities of the urban fabric and the, the challenges in texas what would yeah. you say are the priorities in terms of housing and urban design in the state yeah, it's interesting. You know, we've we've had this discussion recently, even with with Paula Federico and and the Moya team. Is you know always more affordable housing, always more workforce housing. You know, the, this country is growing. People people want to come here. People that are here are 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 always looking to do better, are doing better, but we can't make it so that the folks that are delivering services are you know getting pushed out further and further to the fringes. I, I remember a story when I arrived at Kennedy Airport in, back in, in New York once, and I was talking to this woman, she was waiting for the bus with me, and you know she was saying she was going home, and that it was gonna take her two hours to get home so that she could put her head down for three hours and come right back to the airport the next day, right? To work there. And I'm like, come on, like that's, it's crazy, like you, we, if you want more services, if you're, if we're growing, like we have to make it so that the people that are living and working there could, could, can actually afford it. Okay? And then now there's always this complaints like, why do I have to wait for this? That they were like, why isn't this restaurant lobby open? It's just because there's not people that live close so they can, can work there. So always, I would say always more affordable workforce housing. There's a group that we work with named Comunidad Partners. The CEO is Antonio Marquez. Uh, they're fantastic. They are very intentionally focused on affordable workforce housing that integrates services like health services. Um, and, and they're very thoughtful about their approach and they run wonderful communities all across the U S and so, you know, hats off to them that they, they, you know, they, they understand the importance of, of that, of affordable workforce housing. Yeah. Yesterday there was an event, a public event in DC and Mayor Bowser was talking about that precisely how they need the teachers in DC public schools to be able to live in the city. Right. So the policy decisions are not made thinking about what other county is doing, but about what the city can do for their teachers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So in this conversation, how do you, from the perspective of connective agency, communications, how do you engage the different stakeholders to convince them of the need of affordable housing? Yeah, you know, you know one, one of the things that we are very intentionally focused on always is um, just because of kind of where, where we participate in all of this is uh, supporting, supporting leaders, uh, supporting entrepreneurs, um, Entrepreneurs are the ones that are starting and, and running and growing businesses that, if successful, will employ uh, people. They will uh, they will employ people and they will uh, give consumers products and services that they need. Right, and so the worst thing that can happen in in, in an area and for an entrepreneur is that a, a business that opens closes um because then you eventually may then get the the broken window syndrome so if we can support uh entrepreneurs and leaders that you know grow their businesses broaden their impact make differences in communities where they set up shop um you know you mentioned michigan before i i, I went to i went to michigan and, and a big thing that we always talk about there is like be a leader where you are right so like coach juan howard he he talks about like how you know you got to be one percent better every day, like just focus on being one percent better every day. And so today is the first day of the fourth quarter, right? So like, what if you're one percent better every day this quarter? Like you're gonna have you're gonna end this year like so much better. And so that's that's how we participate and that's how we help entrepreneurs is to like create growth, create vision, create acceleration, amplify their voices and their brands so that they can thrive, 
employ people, give options to consumers, and sort of that's how the whole community will benefit. Thank you very much. Yeah. So this has been wonderful. I'm now going to open the floors to hear from the team and the questions they may have. Cool, thank you. Come on, Romina, you, you, you can <laughs> ask about millonarios. <laughs> Hi. Hi. What was the most difficult community that you have worked with? Ooh, that, that's a really good question. Um, well, so it's interesting because you said you very specifically said community. Um, I think that there there are no there are no difficult communities, right? There there are there they're just communities, right? Every every community has its unique perspectives and challenges, and you know that's that's one of the things that you know we emphasized um, just recently in, in in a presentation we made is like we don't arrive with to these communities with any bias or preconception like we we just we arrive to listen and learn and and then bring voices to the people that are there like i, I think that we are helpers and the other thing is honestly like if if people people don't want help like leave leave them alone like they <laughs> they 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 want um what they want right so yeah i think that we are honored and privileged to get to do some of the work that that we do and i think that like the difficulty maybe is is in the eye of, of the person that is, that is the beholder that it's there so if you go with sort of a more open honest positive approach that that's probably probably best Manny, in, in Mari can talk more about it. We had a community of a lot of entitled people that didn't want to have a part in front of them because the noise of the kids was just too much in the morning. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, that's that's you. That's almost like the reverse of the the, the nimbyism, the not in my backyardism yeah. that, that you hear about all the time, and so. Um, we talked about phases, right? So maybe not too much at one time. We talk about uh, really sort of focusing on hearts and minds first so that there's not a, a, a sort of concrete thing that goes in early, but more like there's a, a more like a psychological and there's a, a positive approach building that happens first or maybe even second and third before like the real thing gets in there. So um, in a situation like that, I think that you might be able to show people like, we've done this in other places and look at this, like this is what has happened after the fact, right? So that they say, oh, okay, you know, what I thought was gonna be the result, maybe, maybe, maybe it's not, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say focus on the good, amplify the good, and, and you know, let them see that there is, there is a pos there is positive that can come out of it. And it goes back to your earlier point on empathy. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's not only about your preferences. You live in a community and you need to understand other people's needs. Right. Right. Yeah. We, you know, if, if you can sort of uh, emphasize the, 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 the priority to be good global citizens and how that matters, even across the street, <laughs> I think that's, that, that would be a good approach. Good question. More Thank questions. you. All right, so I have a question if nobody we have a shy audience today, Manny. It's not usual. All right, so you said before the interview started that you love soccer. <laughs> yes. And I think soccer and baseball are probably the most Latino sports, even though basketball is big. Uh, have you seen that growing in the States? Yeah, so so there's, a, so yes, I love soccer. I, 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 there, you know, my parents will tell you that I probably learned how to kick a ball and dribble a ball before I actually even learned how to really walk. So I've been playing all my life. Uh, I have aspirations to play again, even though I've had my right 
knee reconstructed like twice ACL uh, surgeries. Uh, my favorite team is uh, AS Roma in Rome. Um, and my wife, Jacqueline, is a self-described soccer widow. Uh, every every season when the when the when the when the season starts from September all the way to May, <laughs> because she's like she just doesn't see me a lot on the weekends, you know, because I'm like passionately following following all the games. Um, but yeah, you know, I remember growing up, uh, many members of the U.S. national team were from Kearney, New Jersey. Like it was like John Harks, Todd Ramos, and there was a couple of other couple of other players there. So that was a big sense of pride. I'm like, man, like the U.S. national team is is doing really well. And Alexi Lalas, I went to university with him. He went, he played at Rutgers, and I used to eat at the same dining hall table with him. He's now a commentator for all the U.S. games. Yeah, the redheaded guy. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, so that was great. And now the interesting thing that you've seen is if you look back to the U.S. team in those days, they were all one color, right? And all the Latinos and all the guys that I used to play with locally, we used to be like, you know, where's all the black and brown players? Like, because we play with some damn good ones and we're really good and and like <laughs> – you know, so so you, you look at the U.S. team now and again, like it looks like America now. It's got, you know, Gianluca Busio plays in Italy. You know, Christian Pulisic plays in England. Uh, you have like all these amazingly talented players that look like America and are representing the U.S. And they're fantastic. Like they just finally broke the top 10 the other day. They beat Mexico. And sorry for anybody who's no, from Mexico so. on, on this call. <laughs> That's uh, that that was really hurtful and bruising to them. But they just they won the gold cup and they won the Concacaf cup. Uh, so, yeah, they, you know they're 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 doing really really well. Um, you know I think you know baseball is is also popular. That's I think that's been sort of more. Latino and Hispanic infused for a longer amount of time because it's like the most popular sport in, throughout the Caribbean, right? The Caribbean mm -hmm. Latino countries like Republica Dominicana and Cuba and Puerto Rico and even Venezuela in, in, in South America. It's the perfect America. sport for the Caribbean. Right. Yep. You don't uh, have to run much. Okay. <laughs> you get to work yeah. out. Yeah, that, that's a, that's exactly what I say all the time. People because people make an argument about who who are the best kinds of athletes. I'm like, okay, let's talk about baseball for a second. Because if you're a left fielder, nobody yeah. hits anything to you, and you strike out four times. Like, did you even have to go to the game? Like, you just you could have just stayed home. <laughs> it's like, come on. But in soccer, you got to run 90 minutes, and you you can't stop. So, soccer. We have a few baseball fans. Yeah, soccer team, gets so my. Sorry. Maybe. <laughs> Dennis can argue on the country. We have a question from Renata. She yes. says that her mic is not working today, but she says, are the communities you work very diverse or just minorities? As oh, I love, actually, I love that question. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, yes. The answer is yes. They, they are diverse and there are... Um, There are some communities that, you know, we can, based on what segment or sector of the community we work with, could be described as, again, using the term majority minority or minority exclusive. But, you know, it it takes everyone. It takes all kind to, like, really, really make positive change, positive impact. So maybe the sort of the point there is for Renata and anyone who has a question about that is you, you have to. You have to learn how to work with everyone and you have to do business the way business is done where you are, right? Uh -huh. So when we first made the move south to Louisiana, I showed up as this, you know, New Yorker guy because when you grow up there, like you're very myopic and you think that that's the only place in the world that matters. And so I got to Louisiana and I, I was like, oh, I missed this about New York and why aren't they doing it this way? And then People are too slow here. And like, why does it take people five minutes when they get to the to the counter and Starbucks to like look at the menu? I'm like, it's the same thing as yesterday. Come on, like <laughs> get your drink ready. Let's go. <laughs> you know? And then after being there a year, like it changed for me, like mindset wise. I was like, you know what? People don't care like the way like how I specifically feel. Like their business is done a certain way here. So I have to arrive here and do business the way that people want to do business in the way it's done here, 
right? Not, I can't bring my preconceived way of doing things and expect that that adjusts to me. I have to, we have to, our team has to adjust to the way it's done there, right? So uh, yeah, great question. Hope that was valuable. Uh, thank you, Mero. This has been a great interview. You've been super generous with your time. And I really like the concept that you use that the team, the USA team looks like America, that a community looks like America, because sometimes you get this misconception uh, through representation uh, of a different America that looks that's more in the past. Right. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you for having me. We're we doing this again tomorrow. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very thank much, everybody. everybody. Thank, thank you, everybody. For money after really the thank you. After the thank you. Match. Oh yes, let's have it. Let's do it. Let's do thank a Moya you. versus Connective soccer match. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks, man. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Manny.